that's going to entice you to read on, isn't it? So let's read the word of God together from Ecclesiastes and chapter 9. I've been thinking about all that he's already said. The writer says this. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It's the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with the, all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favour to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For a man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So reads God's word. I'm almost tempted to say, good luck, Caleb. <laughs> As we come to that later on, though, seriously, God will bless us. As what you want to say to us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. In June 2024, one of the biggest stars in the world will be arriving at Liverpool. Arriving in Liverpool and playing three shows in three nights just down the road at Anfield Stadium. Does anyone know who it is who's coming to Liverpool next year? Who is it? Can you believe Brian knew? <laughs> it is, oh, you saw my notes. There we go. It is Taylor. Anyone have tickets? No tickets? Oh, someone at the back. Lovely. Taylor Swift is coming to Liverpool. Now, for those who don't know, Taylor Swift is currently on a world tour. The tour, according to Time magazine, is estimated to generate close to $5 billion in the United States alone. By all accounts, the show is some spectacle. 
Every night, Taylor Swift performs 44 songs with 16 different outfit changes to match with every era of her career, which is why the tour is called Eras. In a podcast I listened to recently, the experts say that her 2023 is the most significant year a pop star has had since Michael Jackson in 1985. She's also recently started dating Travis Kelsey, who is one of the best players in the NFL, which is America's most popular sport. And as his girlfriend, she attends every one of his games, and the camera follows her more than it follows the game. (laughs) Now, the games she has attended have resulted in 10 million more people tuning in to watch the game. That's the influence Taylor Swift has. I could go on, but let's just say Taylor Swift has it all. Last month, it was my wife Bethan's turn to pick the film, and we landed on the Taylor Swift documentary on Netflix. It was an interesting watch. But the moment that struck me the most was at the Grammy Awards ceremony, which is the biggest annual music award show in the world, and Taylor Swift, at 21 years old, won album of the year. And when reflecting on how she felt as she received the award, this is what she said, quote, this award was all I focused on. This was all I wanted. I got to the mountaintop and all I could think was what now? I got to the mountaintop And all I could think was what now? Ecclesiastes is a book for our time. It speaks about our world and our culture in such a profound way. In it, as you'll have studied over the last number of months, Solomon conducts what we'll call a huge social experiment. He tries everything the world has to offer to the most extreme level. For example, the Bible tells us that Solomon hosts incredible parties. Now, he doesn't do do what we might do at our own party and connect our Spotify to the nearest speakers. Chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes tells us that Solomon phoned the greatest bands of the time, phoned the greatest artists of the time, and got them to play at his parties. They were that good. The Bible tells us that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which means that he knew in every way the most beautiful women in the world. The Bible tells us that he had possessions beyond what we could fathom. He built the equivalent of national parks. He had reputation, power, and prestige. In chapter 2, Solomon says that he kept from, sorry, in chapter 2, Solomon says that he kept his heart from no pleasure. And yet, after all that, his conclusion was the same conclusion that Taylor Swift came to 3,000 years later at the 2010 Grammy Awards ceremony. Solomon and Swift reached the mountaintop and said, what now? The picture I have in my head of Solomon as he writes Ecclesiastes, and it's just a picture, but I imagine him as an old man sitting in his rocking chair by the fire and in all the wisdom that he's acquired through all the experiences that he's had, he speaks to us tonight in Bethel Church. We might not be the Taylor Swifts of the world. We might not have reached the mountaintop to the extent that she has. But we chase it. We chase comfort. We chase experiences, holidays, reputation, power, to be mortgage-free. 
These things aren't inherently wrong, but we can so often indulge the desires of our heart in pursuit of something that in our day and age is so often chased after, and that is a life of ease. But tonight in chapter 9, Solomon's wisdom encourages us to run on a different path than the world. Rather than a life of ease, in chapter 9, he wants us to chase a way of life that's both full of depth and simplicity. Our time this evening will be split into three headings. And to begin with, as you can see on the screen, in verses 1 to 3, we learn that death is evil and certain. If you've got your Bibles, if you could open Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. It will be on the screen as well. Let's read those verses together. Solomon writes, So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so it is with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil In everything that happens under the sun, the same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. In the 1994 classic American film Forrest Gump, starring the great Tom Hanks, Forrest says this, death is simply a part of life. Solomon strongly disagrees. In verse 3, he describes death not as simply a part of life, but as an evil. Death is evidence of what has gone wrong in the universe. It wasn't meant to be this way. It wasn't meant to be a part of life. God's intention when he created the universe, when he created man in his image, was not for us to die. We were made to live with him and for him for all eternity. But we rejected his rule and death entered the world. Solomon contradicts how many in our world view death. Many see death as a beautiful transition from this life into another, or as a graduation into a better place, or as a resting in peace. But Solomon speaks in a blunt, direct, realistic, unsentimental tone. Verse 3, this is the evil in everything, or maybe your version say, in all that happens under the sun. Look at that word, please, everything or all. What Solomon is saying is what we know to be true in our lives. Things we have break. Beauty we see deteriorates. Nature is fractured. Wars are endless. Death is the evil that is in everything. Moreover, Solomon writes that death shows no favoritism. It is the common destiny, verse 2, the common destiny for the righteous and the wicked. Shakespeare, in his profound play, Hamlet, touches on this very idea in what's known as the grave diggers scene. Hamlet is a young Danish prince, and he famously, towards the end of the play, stands over an open grave. 
And he asks the grave digger, who does this grave belong to? And the grave digger replies by saying, Yorick, the court jester. Hamlet then does something very strange. He proceeds to pick the skull of this man, Yorick, this court jester, this man of little reputation. He picks up his skull and he brings it to his face and he holds the skull in his hand. And in that moment, Hamlet realizes something. He realizes that this is the faith for all humanity. As he stands there, he thinks, yes, this is the faith for Yorick, the court jester. But he muses and says, it is also the faith for Alexander the Great, for Julius Caesar and other great men. Shakespeare, like Solomon, understood the certainty of death for all whether righteous or wicked, whether great or small. As Hamlet looks at this skull, he sees every single one of us. He sees the evil described in verse 2, that death is in everything and death is for everyone. But Solomon goes one step further than the bard. In verse 12, Solomon further emphasizes the evil nature of death. So just glance your eyes down the passage a little bit to verse 12. Let me read this. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Death is evil, yes, because it's the common destiny for all. But death is evil because we are ignorant as to when we will face it ourselves. Look at the language in this verse. Some of those words, caught, snare, trapped. Look at the image as well that Solomon uses of a fish. A fish swimming along a river, going about its day, unaware and oblivious to the cruel net of death. What I'm about to say isn't intended to be flippant in any way. It's the truth that Solomon is trying to wake us up to this evening. That at any moment of any day, maybe even this day, we could die, you could die, I could die. Many of us here this evening will know the suddenness of death to be true through experiences that we might have had in our lives. But often, despite that knowledge and despite those experiences, we can live our lives like it's all in front of us. The half-brother of Jesus, James, wrote this. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Can you see what Solomon is doing in these opening four verses? Can you see how he's set, setting up an argument? That it's only when we are confronted with the evil the certainty and the potential suddenness of death that we can learn how to live. Because death, is this not true? Death gives us perspective in a way that nothing else can. Point one, death is evil and certain. Point two, but you are here and life exists. Let's read verses 4 to 6. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. 
their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Up until this point, Solomon's findings on the surface are grim and pessimistic, to say the least. But there is hope. Verse 4 says that we have hope. Why? Because we're alive. Just look at the contrast between the two animals that Solomon refers to when illustrating his point. He uses a dog in verse 4 and a lion. Now, when Solomon refers to a dog, he's not thinking about the domesticated dogs that we might have as pets. Dogs in Solomon's day were rabid, unclean, and revolting scavengers. Yet, he says, dogs like that who are alive, are better off than a majestic lion who is dead. Life equals hope. Just think for a moment about the concept of time itself. So you've got the beginning of time on one hand and the end of time on the other. The universe that God made has existed for Let's just say a while. And in the entire duration of the universe's existence, you and I are alive for the smallest fraction of time imaginable. In the span of time, our lives sit like a grain of sand on a beach, like a raindrop in a storm, like a note in a symphony. And yet, I want everyone to take these two fingers, do it now, and put it on your wrist, and feel it, your beating heart, your pulse, on Sunday the 12th of November at approximately 7.15pm, yes, death is evil and certain, But we are here, and life exists. Therefore, the question for us now is this. What does a life of beauty and meaning and purpose look like as we are precariously poised between life and death? What should I seek in the life that I have been given? Point three. Seek death. Let's read verses 7 to 10. Solomon writes, Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, who you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge nor wisdom. Solomon, in these verses, is pleading with us to take the transient life we've been given and to stop seeking quick and easy comforts. Instead, these verses show us the way to seek significance in our lives, to seek life, to seek beauty, to seek peace, and to seek death. If you glance down to verse 7, we see that good food and good wine are to be enjoyed with good friends who have good senses of humor. Can I say this evening, McDonald's in your car is not dinner. (laughs) As nice as those nuggets might be. Dinner, when the only person talking is the TV, 
is not dinner. Dinner is holy. The cooking process should be slow and measured. Food is to be chewed, savoured and enjoyed. Friends should be invited over regularly. Wine is to be drunk slowly as you absorb the subtlety of every single flavour. Because good food and good wine and good friends are God's gift to you. We were designed by God to have dinner with our friends. Just think about it for a moment. What do all of us do when commemorating the most significant moments of our lives? The human instinct in those moments across culture, across continent, across time is to build and center these occasions around good food with good friends. God has wired us in this way. In Psalm 104, verses 14 to 15, we read this, that God makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. Good food and good wine and good friends are a gift. How will you make space in your life to give it the time God intends for it to have? What else does it look like to seek depth? Verse 8 speaks about our clothes all being always white. What does he mean? White garments in this instance are symbolic of practical acts of righteousness. In other words, he's saying... Do not stand at the center of your universe. That you have been blessed to be a blessing. That all that was given to you should not terminate with you. You can't live a life where you think that all that was given to you is for you. A life of depth, Solomon says, is a life spent serving others wearing these white garments. And a life saving others is a life, simply put, spent obeying the two greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and let that translate into loving your neighbor as yourself. Verse 9, to continue, explores how depth can be found in marriage. Solomon says, enjoy life with the spouse God has given you. For those of you this evening who are married, please look at the word that Solomon uses at the end of this verse. Toil. I love it when the Bible is true to life. Here's the definition for toil. To work extremely hard incessantly which means to work hard over and over and over again day after day after day sound like marriage if it doesn't i don't believe you <laughs> but solomon says in and through the toil there is profound joy and depth to be found Solomon also sneaks in this little clause at the start of verse 9. Do you see it? He says, enjoy life with your wife, comma, who you love, comma. You see, seeking depth with your spouse. Sorry, seek depth with your spouse by reminding yourself and by expressing to them what you love about them. Seek depth in your marriage by praying together, by listening to her, by listening to him. <laughs> Combine verse 7 and 9 and go for a meal together. Practice Sabbath together. And remember, most of all, that to love is a verb, it's an action. And when a man and when a woman 
serve one another day after day, even through the toil. That's where depth in marriage is found. And the final thing Solomon points to in regards to a life spent seeking depth is work in verse 10. Now in our society over the past two years, there's been a growing trend of something called quiet quitting. I don't know if you've heard of this in the newspaper or seen it. The definition for quiet quitting is as follows. Quiet quitting is when employees continue to put in the minimum amount of effort to keep their jobs, but don't go the extra mile for their employer. Now, we might not be part of the quiet quitting movement, or maybe you are, and you're keeping it quiet. <laughs> but I think it acts as a microcosm for a section of our culture today. As I said earlier, it's easy to want ease, to do the bare minimum in work, to see what you can get away with, to clock off a little early, or to get in a little late. But Solomon wants to remind us of how we were designed. Work, which goes against what a lot of people think, work was not a curse of the fall. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, before sin entered the world, humanity was instructed to work. And at that time, if you remember, God looked at his world and said it was good, and that includes work. It is in our nature to take the materials and the gifts God has given us and to use them to create and to inspire and to serve. And while it is vital to ensure that work does not become our entire world, which is another sermon altogether, it is a necessary and soul-giving part of our existence, despite the Sunday night blues that maybe you are feeling this evening. The late Tim Keller, in his brilliant book on work, Every Good Endeavor, says this. Work is as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. It is not simply medicine, but food for our soul. Without meaningful work, we sense significant inner loss and emptiness. People who are cut off from work because of physical or other reasons quickly discover how much they need work to thrive emo emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Wise words from Keller. Now, it is vital to see that the four things Solomon highlights do not form an exclusive list of what a life seeking death and a life enjoying the gifts God has given us include. Solomon wants us to live life as if we will one day no longer have it. An expanded list of what a life of depth and significance is might sound a bit like this. And if you've got a pen, you might want to note a few of these things down. Ride a bike. Go to the beach. Mend relationships deepen relationships, plant and maintain a garden, climb a mountain, go to the theater, learn to make music, visit the sick, care for the dying, feed the hungry, watch a great film, read a book, laugh with some friends until you cry, play football, run a marathon, Listen to Mozart, ring your parents, write a letter, play with your children, play with your grandchildren, learn a language, put your phone down, read the Bible with a younger Christian, speak about Jesus, travel to somewhere you've never been, foster a child, adopt a child, be generous with your money. Shape someone else's life 
by laying down your own. These are just some further ideas of a life spent seeking depth, of what a life spent seeking depth might look like instead of a life spent seeking ease. I have two quick points of application this evening. Firstly, if you are a follower of Jesus and you know him personally, then the four practices Solomon refers to in verses 7 to 10 are all echoes of a time when we live forever with him in the new earth. Let me explain. Eating dinner at the table with friends echoes the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wearing white garments echoes the new perfect life and perfect garments that you'll be given because of Christ. Enjoying life with your spouse echoes the eternal life we'll enjoy with Christ, our bridegroom. And to work well echoes the new world that we'll one day be a part of rebuilding and cultivating again. So do these things, because one day, if you know Christ, you'll be doing them forever. Secondly, and lastly, if you don't yet know Jesus personally, let me remind you of verse 4. You have hope, because you are here and you exist. But also remember that death is evil and certain and can be sudden. So I'm going to finish by reading two verses for those of you who don't know Jesus to ponder. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, we read that now is the day of salvation. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we read that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So while you're alive, run to the one who can give you eternal life. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for the wisdom of Solomon.